You know what it is. It's the neutral corner. It's Danny Glover. And today I'm joined by my special guest, Xavier Miller. Welcome, guys. It's another episode of the neutral. So, how's it going, man? What have you been up to? Really good at the moment. Yeah, Jim's yeah. really busy, so yeah, everything's going well. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Right now, I'm just recovering because uh, you might have seen I was out yesterday for my cousin Craig Richard's birthday. So, we was at some brunch thing, then went roller skating. My foot's all smashed up now. You know what I mean? But we're here. So, um, yeah, man. Great to have you on. Been trying to get you on for a while. But, you know, I know you're busy with the gym and stuff like that, and you're yeah. not the... You're not all over socials, so that's a good thing. You're dedicated to your craft and that. So, yeah, I just want to get people to know a bit more about you, know your story and your journey, as some people, they may have had preconceived conceptions and not know much about you. So this is a time to finally get get it out there. So, um, yeah, so tell us about, um, you know, like where did you grow up, your your family background, stuff like that. Yeah, my, my parents, you know, they... Um Obviously, came to the UK um, in the sixties, and uh, they're from like Halston, Chalkhill sort of area. Okay. And as, new, as soon as my mum well, fell pregnant, you know, she, um, you know, her and my dad decided that you know they wanted to move to a, a different area. They didn't really want to grow the children up uh, in that, in that area, and decided to move to Mill Hill. So, um, yeah, different different experience. Um, I suppose you you know you come out of one area and expect it to be a certain way, but um, yeah, there was a lot of challenges. <laughs> we moving to Mill Hill. I mean, probably one of the biggest ones, which I only found out once I was an adult. Yeah, was that the road that my um, parents decided to buy. Um, they were the first black family on that road, and uh, they signed petitions saying that they don't want them don't want them there. There was no black people on that street. Um, okay, and there wasn't many black people around to honest with you. So. Yeah, you've gone from a you know predominantly black area, you know, like Halsey and Chalk Hill, and then end up going to Mill Hill. So yeah, it was interesting. And um, growing up, you know, as um, walking to school was interesting. Uh, so much different stories, but um, we'd be here, <laughs> we'd be here all day. Like you know, at those times, you know, you had um, a lot of the British flags on the houses and the flats and stuff, and you know, it was skinhead area, combat uh, eighteen era, and uh, yeah, it was it was difficult at times. It was hard. Um, you know, I was very overprotective of my brother as well. It's just me and my brother, older um, or younger. He's younger. Okay. Um, also grew up with my, my cousin as well. So it was really the three of us that grew up, you know. And um, yeah, but honestly, I had the most amazing childhood, you know, just apart from those challenges, you know, that at those times, you had a lot of freedom, a lot more than what you got now. And I'm um, just grateful to my mum and dad for, uh, you know, moving to an area like that, got a good education. And uh, yeah, even though, you know, um, I'm a fighter, I love boxing. Um, I'm not a street or ghetto kid. I'm not that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not that at all. Yeah, yeah. I've just got that bravado once I get in the ring. Yeah. Outside of that, I'm just, you know, I just love my boxing. Yeah. So I take it this was like in the 70s you grew up in then? Yeah. Yeah. So, but I didn't know that it holds in even back then was rough. I know like, say the 80s and 90s, that's yeah. where it got most of its reputation. So yeah, I didn't know that back then it was even rough then. Yeah, there was, listen, there was a lot of bad things going on back then. Um, you know, m- my dad, you know, was part of a sound as well and they used to you know go out a lot you know they were young yeah uh, him and his friends but you know it was going home that was the problem you know the police were a major issue um a lot of times if 10 of them went out you know they'd have to walk each other home and the last person had to take a gamble and go home on their own it yeah was that it was that dangerous in those times mm. and that was probably one of the main reasons why he said no you know I want my kids to grow up here because of what he had to deal with yeah um you know so yeah so they came over like in the Windrush sort of era in the mm-hmm. 60s and stuff. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, so um, what's your first sort of memory of of boxing like growing up? Did you used to watch it as a kid? Yes, yeah, my uncle. My uncle was the one that actually got me into boxing. Um, you know, he was obsessed with boxing, you know, um, and he told me which fighters to watch. And uh, 
you know, at, that, at those times, again, you know, we, it was limited on TV for us. Black and know. white. Yeah, not, not, no, not that. <laughs> <laughs> not going that far back, but in, t- in, in terms of like, you know, where could we watch the boxing? Yeah, yeah. You know, you had the odd channels every now and then would show boxing, but if you really wanted to see the, the big cards, like the Friday night fights and stuff like that, there was a guy in America someone put me in contact with and he used to sell like VHS tapes. Um, you know, you'd, pay i think it was three pounds no it was sorry it was like 12 pounds for a three-hour tape and like 15 pounds for a four-hour tape and uh that's expensive know. back then man yeah yeah well listen it was it was exclusive because you, you used to get the whole card or you know you'd have a long list it'd send you a catalog and then you'd go through it and pick the fights you wanted and obviously there was no money about at those times especially for things like that i couldn't go and ask my parents for that they would say I'm not giving you for that. Yeah, yeah. So what I used to do, I used to do a paper round every Thursday. Yeah. And then on Saturday mornings, I used to go to a car garage and wash cars. And, um, you know, me and my cousin, you know, we liked buying records. You know, I loved the boxing. Fine. So that, that's how I was able to get the money. Yeah. And obviously you still got to pay the delivery as well for that. So, because it's getting chipped over. Yeah. But um, I used to get the tapes. I used to watch the same fights. Over and over again, my dad used to pop into the room sometimes, like before he left out to go to work. I'm watching, you know, a particular fight. You know, he's gone to work all day. He comes back and I'm watching the same fight. He used to say, what's wrong with you? Yeah. But I just wanted to know exactly how these guys were able to do what they were doing. Um, I really like the Midwest style of boxing, um, like the Philadelphia fights. It's just, I, I just, it just, I was just like obsessed with that style of boxing. Yeah. And um, yeah, just ordered loads and loads of tapes. I still got all the VHS tapes now. Okay. Like I've got boxes and boxes and I had I've got about close to like 370, 380 VHS tapes. That's some money. Um, so I just studied, studied all the time. And that was I was doing more of the studying before I actually went to a gym. You know, so yeah, that's that's really how I got into it. It's my uncle that really got me into it, and then I just Yeah. Got so so who do you remember the first um cassette you bought, like the first video <sighs> I you don't. got shipped over? I don't. I or don't do you remember, remember the fighters you used to remember? You can remember off the top of your head who you used to like watching over and over. I I really like watching Mosley. Okay. Um, really like watching James Tony. Um, there yep. was a lot of good guys, the amateurs as well. I used to get all the tapes. Vernon Forrest was an outstanding amateur. Costa Zoo was a really good amateur. So um, yeah, my my knowledge goes back a long, long way. Like studying those guys even before they turned pro, I knew a lot of their journey. So um. Yeah, there was a lot of lot of the kind of styles that I liked. Obviously, you know, you had a lot of guys that were good, like working behind the shoulder those times. But um, you know, the ones that were obviously at the forefront was like like a James Tony sort of style, which I really yeah. loved. Um, but there was a lot of good guys then. You know, Montel Griffin was a great fighter. And there was a lot of good guys, so I had a lot to I had a lot to focus on. Yeah, you know. But ultimately, I think I spent more time watching Evander Holyfield than anybody else. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So then you said that that you did that before you went to a gym. So what um, ultimately gave you the push to decide to go down a, a gymnasium? Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the first experience I had with boxing was um, there was a coach that came to my school, a secondary school, and he was teaching boxing. And, uh, you know, I said to my friends, oh, come, let's go, let's go, let's go. And I was the only one who was really into boxing like that. Yeah. Uh, went to the session, uh, loved it. Um, but, you know, he came back next week and the guy was packing up. I said, well, you, why are you packing up? He said, you know, you're the only person that's turned up. No one else wants to really do it. So they haven't really got the budget or the funding to continue doing it. Yeah. I remember I was really upset about it. Um, I don't cry. <laughs> I very rarely cry about anything, but I was really, really upset. I was a kid. I was like 13, 14 at the time. Yeah. Um, and I said, said no, no, I really want to learn it. And he said, look, I can, I can teach you, but obviously you'll have to come to you know, my setup. And funny enough, it was only like a five minute walk from where I live. Um, he had a very small setup in the garage. The boxing room was about, it's no more than about six, seven foot. Um, and I just started going there after school. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Just, you know, and he was, he was, he was from Malta, but he actually did some training in Detroit. Okay. So it was, it was, you know, when he was talking about certain fighters, it was like, yeah, you know, I watched those kind of guys and, we just built a real bond, a real connection. And I was going religiously for about a good maybe eight, nine months. Yeah. Didn't tell my parents. Well, I told my I told my mum that I wanted to box and that I'd gone to All Stars once and she went crazy. 
You know, yeah. she smashed stuff in the kitchen and said, no, that's not what you're going to do. You know, um, you need to do this, need to do that. So I never told her I was going there. Yeah. I just, you know, went on my own and just, because it was after school, passed there and then just go home. Um, just going there religiously. And then one day I went there and the guy's wife, you know, trainer's wife, she opened the door and said, listen, he's gone. I said, he's gone. She said, you know, he passed away. Oh, no. You know, so um, it was like a really abrupt ending. I was like, for the next few months, I hated boxing. Yeah. You know, because I thought, you know, the, the things that we were talking about, like, you know, I was getting schooled very, very early. Yeah. So we were talking about, like, not just being, like, a world champion, like, looking at different divisions and stuff. It was like, you know, when you're dreaming or something, you're looking ahead and saying, you know, this is it now, this is what I'm going to do. And um, it took me, like, ages and ages to get over it. Not in, not until I was still having fun as a kid, but the boxing side of it, I kept to myself. Yeah. You know, that part was, it was disappointing, you know, and I went to All Stars when I was about 14. Um, I liked it there, Mr. Akai. Uh, yeah. You know, I liked that gym. Mr. Akai. It was a, it was a long, long way from my, from my home. And, you know, again, it was, it was, it was the cost of traveling and stuff like that. Um, so I only ended up going there a few times. And, um, yeah, I went to, went to a few gyms after that, but they never, they kept saying, you're really, really good, but we don't get it. Mm. You know, because it was at those times you know, had the it was it's almost like a traditional way of boxing. The guys were you know they stood up quite straight. They were very good long range, always on their toes, bouncing in and out of range. And I was doing the complete opposite to that. Yeah. And, um, no one could ever come and say they could beat me. That's for sure. But it just like it just it just wasn't for me. Yeah. So I left it alone for years. Um, you know, and then when I did eventually go back to it, you know, I had um. I did settle in Mill Hill. I had about 11, 12 amateur fights, won them. As, oh, as, as was a it junior. Mill Hill ABC? Or? Yeah, as yeah. a junior. Um, it's just very short. And then I decided a few years later, I must have been maybe early 20s, maybe 23, 24. Yeah, you know, I'll just go pro. Um, doctor said, there's no way you're going to pass your medicals. Uh, you know, it's difficult for me to talk about. It's really difficult. Even now, it's difficult to talk about because... I thought, you know, this he, that guy spent so much time, you know, training me. There's no point in me just, like, not doing something with it. Yeah. You know, I'll just find someone who's going to just be able to coach the star that I'm I'm working with and then build from there. But, you know, uh, yeah, that was disappointing as well. So walked away from it again. And then, um, you know, lucky, luckily enough, I was putting on a lot of weight at the time because I didn't really want to be involved in boxing. And uh, my cousin said to me, oh, there's, some, there's a couple of coaches down in a, like a fitness sort of gym. Yeah. But he said, one of them trains at All Stars. I said, we should go down and go and do some some training. And I went down there. And it's like, you know, I liked the training. You know, we were there like only like twice a week, but I liked it. And then I got back into it again, started doing a bit of sparring. And then um, randomly one kid said to me, oh, you know, I want to be able to box like you. You know, why don't you just forget about boxing and do like, like boxing and just coach me instead? Went home, thought about it for a while, and then, you know, he kept coming to the gym and saying, yeah, you know, what about what I spoke to you about? And I said, you know, okay, I'll do it. Um, yeah, and that was, that's really how the coaching started. Okay, very, very interesting. So when you was boxing down, was uh, Tony Cox down there? Look, all, all those guys, it was Ken, Ken Thomas was the first guy I met, and yeah. we are still very, very close now. Um, but when I went down there as a 14, 15-year-old, obviously, those guys didn't know who I was. But when I actually bumped, him, bumped into them again years later, and I must have been 30, 30 31 yeah. when I first bumped into Ken Thomas. And then um, there was another class in the same gym uh, run by Earl Austin, yeah. another All-Stars coach. You know, and he kept looking at me, looking at me, looking at me. Like, each time I come to the classes, you get, I know you, I know you. But I thought he was going to say, yeah, because I remember you coming down to All-Stars. Yeah. And he said, no, I know your dad. You know, he said, yeah, because... You would, they used to grow up around the same area. They grew up around the same area. Yeah. He said, yeah, it was stunning familiar. And then one time he goes, who's your dad? And just told him, he said, oh, okay, no, I know. Yeah, yeah, So, um, you know, we came, we became quite close as well. And I think it's because of those two guys, really, that I kind of decided to get involved in the coaching. Yeah. You know, I wasn't really ever going to go back to it. Um, I was just happy being a fan of it and just just watching it, really. Yeah. Or just going to shows every now and then. Yeah. Yeah, I really got into it from there. And then, um, yeah, took it to another level. Okay, yeah, one of my uncles, Glenn Waters, he used to box for uh, All Stars as well. Great gym, yeah, yeah. Great gym. And I, I boxed a guy from there, TJ De Silva. Um, in the same guy that boxed Holyfield in the amateurs. I'm I mean, not sure. TJ that passed away. 
I don't know if he's passed away. Heavyweight or cruiserweight? It's no, he was a he was a he was a middleweight when I boxed him, but I was we was like sixteen years old then. Yeah, the only so. TJ that I know that's all stars, he's the one that passed away. He, he definitely boxed Holyfield in the amateurs. Okay, yeah, cause they spoke yeah. about him. Okay, yeah, but um, so what school life for you like, um, like in general, like school life grades? What type of student was you? Yeah, I mean English, like English language and literature was yeah exceptional, but wasn't really great with maths. Yeah, but English that was, that was my thing. Yeah, um, yeah, you know, went on to you know. Got a couple of degrees. Like I w- one was art design, which I tell you I can't draw anything. So I don't even, <laughs> even know I even got that. Yeah. Um, did criminology a few okay. years later, and did a um, diploma in social policy and care, and uh, you know that led to me getting involved in education, and eventually meeting my business partner Nick Prempe. Okay. Uh, so yeah, that's very, that's good, man. Good stuff. So as you say, uh, so you got into that ultimately got you into the coaching side. So. Um, where did you first start training fighters and who was like your first fight? Who was the first sort of fighters you, you was involved with? Yeah, I st- the first fighter I started training was TJ, TJ Williams. Um, you know, uh, welterweight, you know, he had very long arms. <laughs> you know, he um, very, very easy to teach. Uh, you know, he's he was exceptional. Uh, they started calling him the knees and Mayweather at some point. I mean, everyone, he was so confident he would talk to you during sparring. He just, he just had really good eyes. He could see everything coming. Um, yeah. You know, uh, in the gym, I'd, I'd say he was like one of the best gym fighters I've ever had. Um, never really got a chance to really box. I mean, because he had two really bad injuries. He had two dislocated shoulders. Really? So then he had to end up, you know, retiring very, very early. Oh. Um you know, he, he was carrying injury in a in a box cup years ago, um, and then he got to the final, and then and the other shoulder actually dislocated in the final. Um, you know, we were in the ambulance, and because it had happened once before, and he was so good, you, I was able to you know, he was able to turn south for he, he could do everything in there. Yeah. Um, you know, he just said to me in the ambulance, I, "I can't do this anymore. I know I could beat all these guys, but I'm I'm not confident in you know the shoulders holding up." You know, he started using his left arm more than his right and then he had to switch it the other way around and he just got it just got too much eventually so yeah he retired early. but he was the first and then it was a uh, another kid called uh Shaquille Johnson you know um he walked into Stonebridge Boxing Club when I, okay. I think that was the first gym that I actually started coaching in like full-time I was moving around different gyms before that and using but I was in the park training guys or wherever we can get the work in but um yeah I think he was the one that actually put like mo- the majority of my time was Shaquille Johnson um, again, beautiful boxer, very tall, rangy, um, really good on the outside, complete opposite to TJ. They were both really, really good at what they do. Um, but, you know, I was modelling him more of like a Tommy Hearns sort of fight, you know, very, very clever Shaq. Yeah. We're very, very close. Um, you know, he had ended up having about 10, 11 fights, but again, played with injuries. Um, he started having knee problems, um, wasn't moving around the same, and he's never actually, he actually eventually did, he did actually turn pro. Sign with Goodwin, but never got to have his debut. Yeah. Um, because the problem with knees are just, they're still an issue now. I mean, he'll go to work and then, you know, he's got to have time off because of the pains. And so I thought it was growing pains at the time because I started training at 14 years old. Yeah. Um, you know, he's in his 20s now, but he's married, got kids now. So oh. I don't know if he's ever going to get back into it. You know, and he's settled, he's happy. Yeah. Um, I'd be happy if he actually got back into it because, again, he's, you know, got a lot of talent. How old is he now? I'd say maybe around 26. Okay, he's so got, it's not... He's, it's, yeah, he's still young enough to get back into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. Uh, it cut, again, he's another one. It took... He's the complete opposite to TJ. Where well, TJ was really, really easy to teach. It took Shaq a long time to get it. Now, I'm talking in, in terms of the aggression and the style he wanted to box. But, um, again, he's very clever. He used to come to all the amateur shows. And then one day he came in the gym and said, oh, okay, can you get me a fight now? I was wondering what's take what took you so long. Yeah. He said, "No, I, I know, I know what they're looking for," and he went on just won his first fight. Six damage about easy. Yeah. So yeah, very good fighter, Shaquille. I, I hope he does get a chance to come back in. Yeah. yeah. So going through your um, coach's license, did you find that easy? Was there any sort of uh, tribute? I think it was easier becoming a head teacher. To be honest with you, was it? it was, yeah, it was, a, it was because I never really was into amateur boxing. Yeah. You know, um, obviously watching it but I didn't ever want to be an amateur coach and then you know from there it wasn't it wasn't really the plan 
Um, so when I went for my license the first time, they failed me. I said, oh, we, I think we, it'd be better if you went to an amateur boxing gym. I was like, oh, I was on the train the way back. I was like, oh, not again. Like, you know, obviously disappointed not being able to box. You know, um, it's just like from the amateurs and then, you know, going pro, I was like, maybe this is just not it, you know? Yeah. And um, I was like, no, you know what? All right, fine. So I started coaching in a couple of um, uh, amateur boxing clubs, Stonebridge, Wembley, um, a great guy called Junior. Um, and then... And then I went for the license again. And, well, actually before that, I was working a couple of gyms and I didn't feel comfortable. Like, you know, I wanted to teach boxers a certain way, but yeah. you can't you can't do that when it's not your own gym. Yeah, and when always, there's a head coach, there's always... I always respected the fact it was their gym and they wanted it done a particular way. So I didn't ever say anything. I just did what they wanted me to do. Mm-hmm. But um, I was desperate to get and get my own, my own gym. And lucky enough for one of my boxers, you know, I was driving him home one time and he said, you know, there's a centre that um, does boxing, but there's hardly any, there's hardly anyone ever there. So we walked in, and um, there was three ladies there, trustees. You know, I just said, um, you know, can you please give me a chance? Um, they said, oh, we're going to stop the boxing because no one's coming. We said, well, we're actually going to stop in a couple of weeks. You know, because they do other activities there, but the boxing just wasn't wasn't working wasn't, for them. Yeah, it wasn't popping. And I said, just, just give me one week, give me a week, and uh, they did that. Um, I think the first session. Had about thirty people there. Yeah, you know, a lot of fighters followed me from the gyms they were at before, and a lot of my friends came to support as well. And uh, yeah, that was twenty thirteen, I think. Some 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 coaches might see that as poaching. <laughs> yeah, I, well, <laughs> but it happens. Listen, yeah. it's, it, fighters are free to go where they want to go. Yeah, yeah if of anyone course. gets upset over that, then you're in the wrong business. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, and I've been there ever since. Yeah, you know, I'm really grateful to uh, Miss Matthews who was you know, leading at the time. Shout out Miss Matthews. And she's got all her daughters there and they've embraced me and everything I've ever needed from them, they've helped me. Yeah. Um, well, and me and Nick are still there now, you know, our business partner. So very grateful to them because I might have still been working other people's gyms now if I hadn't, like, been given that opportunity, you know. Oh, so this is where the IQ boxing gym? That's where I am now, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was called uh, it was called Kingfisher Boxing Club before. Uh, then they switched it to Neesden briefly and then when me and Nick took over, we uh, you know, called it IQ Neesden. Yeah, because there's a Kingfisher in um, Norfolk. Yeah, yeah Norfolk, yeah. up Norwich Ways. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, oh, no, so that's good. So, so then how did you and Nick meet up? Like, how, yeah. did, you, how did you find each yeah, other? Yeah, um, well, I was, I was working at a primary school for, for about seven years, seven, eight years. Uh, I was a Senko at the school, you know, working with kids with uh, behavioural difficulties, reading difficulties and stuff like that. And... Um, you know, I said to the head teacher at the time that I wanted to reduce my days because I wanted to start a company called IQ Boxing. And I wouldn't be able to do that if I was working here full time. Um, so I slowly started reducing my days. And then, um, you know, uh, they made some changes at the school. Um, I was working with a lady called Alison O'Connor. You know, she's the one that actually got me into education, sent me on all these courses. I didn't know what the courses meant, but she said, don't ask me any questions, just do it. Yeah. And, um, you know, I followed her lead and then, you know, I worked, worked my way up the scale and, you know, and became part of the senior management team and I was really grateful to her, um, you know, one of my closest friends. And, um, yeah, and then uh, I left that school and uh, I went home and I'll be honest with you, I was like, what have I done? Yeah. Because when you have a full-time job, you know, you do, it's, it's security. Exactly. You, know, you do get lazy in a way. Complacent. Yeah. And um, I was thinking, okay, how am I going to pay my bills and, you know, so I said, you know, I'll start doing some agency work here or here or there, and uh, while I'm trying to build the company. And funny enough, they sent me to a school where I met my business partner. I was yeah. only going there once a week, and uh, I was only there, I think I was there for a couple of weeks. And I, I said to, him, I remember this conversation when you when you have an interview, Nick, he'll, he'll, he'll tell you. I said you should be running the school. I could see something in him really early, yeah. and Nick's only like 30, I think Nick's about 35, maybe 36, so he's a lot younger than me. Yeah. But I could see it, you know, he could, I, I said, you could, you could do it, definitely. And I actually stayed on because of him. Um, the governor, the, the lead governor of the school, um, she asked me if I, if I wanted to be a head teacher, the teacher of the school. Yeah. I hadn't been a head before, I'd been quite high, high up, but I hadn't been a head. And um, I remember saying to her, I only came here to do part-time work, I'm trying to build a company. 
But if Nick can be my deputy, I'll do it. Yeah. Then I'll do it. And, um, you know, that's how me and Nick became really close. And, uh, you know, while we were working every day, we kept talking about this company and how we're going to build it and how we're going to, you know, get fighters. And initially it was like, okay, we'll get a gym. We'll just go pro and we'll start building from there. Yeah. And it's Nick that said, no, you know what? I think it was a good idea if we did the amateurs. And, uh, you know, I should have listened to him the first time around and maybe I would have passed my interview the first time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, we started building from there. Um, you know, we started with a really, really good stable of uh, amateurs. I remember we had uh, Dennis Wahome, uh Bobby Woods, uh, Shaquille Johnson, Adrian Redman. We had a really good stable. And then Youssef joined maybe a couple of, couple of years later. Okay. With a strong, wrong stable, strong stable. And then... Few, a few, a couple of years later, after I think Robbie Chapman came along as well. He was one of my better amateurs. He okay. was really good. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we we just started building from there and just grateful. You know, a lot of most of the guys that we had back then, we've got them now as pros. Yeah. So you know, yeah. me and Nick have done a really good job and just really happy with the development of the club and you know what we've done so far. You know, we've um, been involved in some big fights and had some really good fights. So yeah. Yeah. No, and that's a testament to you and Nick because, as you know, a lot most fighters when they turn pro. They don't have the same coaches. They go off to a different gym, different coaches. So for you to keep hold of a lot of your fighters and turn them over, um, yeah, that just says a lot about it. It was really, really important for us, you know, to you know to build with the fighters that we had. You know, I love what Emmanuel Stewart did with Tommy Hearns. You know, having him as a decorated amateur and then, to, and then you know they they were they were a team. Yeah, and watching all the videos, you know, from when they're young going up and all the interviews and stuff, I was like, oh, I'd like to do it that way. Yeah, you know, I like I want people to know that I had boxes in my gym, you know, that I train, whether it is that you unlicensed or amateur, it's the, that we've you know developed at our club, you know, and then they turn pro. Mm. Um, you know, the hope, high profile thing is cool, it's fine, but that's not what I got into it for. You know, I spent so many years of my life studying that I wanted to pass on to someone else because I didn't get a chance to do it. So yeah, yeah, you know, it's um more more than anything else proud of that and the fact that me and Nick as business partners you know have um, stuck together because a lot of guys especially in our community you know they start well and then there's always an issue they always fall apart and then you know they go their separate ways yeah that's never been the case with me and Nick and we we said we're gonna stay on code we're gonna stay on yeah that's definitely. what I like to hear I love that I love that so um as you said you got with your uh, you had stable of fighters so then how did you get your um big break and get involved with uh, Dillian White? Um, I think before, just before I met Dillian, I think that's probably, I think we were on a high. You yeah. know, that was probably the best period of my coaching career. You know, Kay had just went on, went on, went on to win his uh, his title. You know, we Is were really Kay developing. Prosper? Kay Prosper, yeah. yeah, we yeah. Were developing Yusuf really well. Um, trying to model everybody off like what I've, what I've done with Yusef, you know, taking on, you know, good, taking on good fights and learning fights, you know, and I mean, challenging fights so you can see where your career can go. And, you know, everybody was on the up, you know, we had five and oh, some of us on seven, no, um, you know, Kay had lost at Southern area and then came to us and then went on to an English title. So, you know, within like the boxing board, they knew like who I was because I'm out, like every other week with boxers. Yeah. You know, we were really busy. Like yeah, Dennis Wahome was out all the time. Adrian Redman, uh, Yasser Algena joined us as well. Um, you know, we had a really, really good, we had one of the best stables coming up. And, um, you know, I met Dean quite a while before I met Dillian. Uh, okay. You know, Dean came, used to come down to my gym and, uh, you know, taught boxing all the time. And then one time he came down with Dillian and just did some work with Dillian. They just started from there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's good. So, how did what was your, how how would you say your time was with him? Like, what was some of the most memorable moments and experiences that you you learned training with, with uh, Dill? Yeah, um, I, I I just respected how hard he trained. Yeah, um, I really liked that he was at my gym because he was high profile, and the other guys were domestic level working their way up. Yeah, and for them to watch him train that hard. Um, you know, they thought they trained hard until they watched him. Yeah. You know, he was his training was, uh, you know, he took it to another level. And um, obviously, they lo loved being around him. Uh, Dillian took a real liking to Yusef very early. Um, you know, when he came to train, I think the second or third time he came to train, Yusef was sparring. And, uh, and I said to Dillian, oh, can you just do his corner? 
you know, so he can pick up a couple of things from you. And everything Dillian told you to do, he was doing it. You know, they um, built a respect and a bond from there early. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, it took a real luck into him because the hard work. And I yeah. think he maybe saw something in himself. You see, he, he knew that Yusuf was really serious about his boxing. Yeah. And um, I think that's why he ultimately ended up signing him. Yeah, no, he's you know, a real talent. Um, but yeah, it was just having him around. Um, and he's got a unique style. Um, it wasn't. It's not a style that I'd ever come across before. Um, had a lot of different styles in the amateurs, a hell of a lot, you know. But Dillian, you know, he make it make he makes it work for him. Yeah. And uh, like I said, the other thing that I really liked was that he was he wanted to challenge himself. You know, I remember even like during, I think training camp maybe for the rematch of Vetkin. You know, he said, you know, I want to box everybody in my era. Before it's all done, I want to be able to box. I want to box everybody. You know, and if I did lose, I want to get a chance to, you know, get a rematch. Yeah. You know, that I admired and liked as well because that's the era of boxing that I'd studied. You know, these guys fought three, four times. Yeah. Maybe a lot more than that. Yeah. You know, and um, they weren't scared to take on challenges. You know, they weren't take, scared to lose and come back. They weren't scared to take on, like, like the best guy, you know, and I think that's what we need in boxing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I think that, that and obviously going away for a long, long period. I mean, I've been in training camps before with high profile boxers. I mean it's that's not it wasn't the first time. Um but I was the head coach for this one. Yeah. So that's why it felt a little bit different. Um but yeah I've been you know I've been around Don for a long Don Charles for years. Um you know I've been in a couple of fights with Derek and uh yeah I was involved in the Takam fight as well. And I think that's Derek's best performance to me. Yeah. Um one of the, one of his best performances. And obviously when he had the rematch with Dinny he performed really well as well. So yeah. Yeah I've been around a long time. Yeah. Um, but funny enough, it was my, it was, you know, one of my good, my good friends in boxing was Steve Goodwin early in my coaching career. He said, you won't be here long. And I said, what are you talking about? You know, yeah. I mean, I've, only just, I've just brought my fighters to you because Don said to me, you know, if you want your guys to be busy and be managed well, you know, in the early stage of their career, you know, it'd be a good idea for them to learn what it is to be a pro boxer. And Steve would be the guy to do that. Yeah. You know, so me and Steve became, you know, really close, really close. But after about, about eight, nine months of being around Steve, he said, you're going to go way past this. And at the time, I didn't know what he was talking about. I just, I was just happy just coming up with my boxers. Yeah. So, um, yeah, shout out to Steve, you know, and even now. Yeah, shout out. Even now, I call Steve, you know, if I need any advice on anything, he's always there, always. Yeah. So, um, yeah, what was the experience like and training out in Portugal, like the setup and stuff like that? How, would you, how was that different to, say, training out in the UK? What very, di- very different because... More than anything, I like I like the day to day running of a gym. Like you know, when I'm in my gym, I've got, you know, I've got the amateurs training. I've got a, I had a, at that time I had about six professional boxers. Yeah. So I'm always busy doing something in the gym day to day. When I went to, went out to Portugal, and obviously at that time, you know, COVID, the pandemic, you know, is um, obviously a nightmare for everybody. Yeah. Didn't go out there intending to get stuck there. <laughs> we just went out there for a training camp. I don't yeah. think anybody knew what was coming. This is very very early stages. Yeah. It's before they've stopped any flights or anything like that. Okay. Yeah, this is early, early. Um, so, yeah, it was very different. You know, you're out there just with one fighter. Um, different setup. Uh, I don't I don't usually go with my fighters to S&C sessions, but, you know, the group is very, very tight. Yeah. You know, Dillian's, he, he likes his people being, his, you know, close training team, being together all the time. I respected that as well. Um you know, and a lot of times, you know, it's, it was it was it was fun because, you know, it's uh, when you when you're with someone new, you know, you yeah. get to show them a lot of different things, and you know, he does a lot of things really really well. Yeah. You know, um, you know, he's uh, got a lot of ide- ideas of his own. He knows what he wants to do, and that's why he got so far in boxing. Yeah. You know, um, but yeah, it's definitely a very very different experience. It was different to anything thing that I'd been involved with before. Yeah. Even though I'd worked with other boxers before. And been part of different training camps. Um, this was quite different out there. Yeah. Um, but I did miss the day to day running in my gym. Yeah. Because I remember um, seeing uh, Pesta. He was training out there and he come back phenomenal shape. Like so, that training it looked serious. It looked very yeah, serious. The training out there is good. I mean, and, and you know, and the facilities as well. Yeah, the facility was just, yeah had everything was in the same station. You know, so it was good, and we were living on base as well. Yeah. And I remember but, even Dillian um, when Wilder, when he, do you remember when he did the little bench press thing and he nearly knocked himself out? And Dillian was like, Look, I'm doing that with like one hand. 
<laughs> he's just doing yeah, something else. Like, he's, he's, he's just very, very strong. Yeah. You know, very strong. Enough yam and banana. Yeah, so. He's a strong, strong guy. Yeah. But yeah, you know, shout out to, again, like the amount of like support I had while I was out there. Everyone knew I was out there on my own, you know, but the fighters came over, you know, John Harding was out, came out there. Yusuf came out, Kay Prosper came out, Jesse Brandon came out. You know, um, Ez, uh, my, my heavyweight, Ergo, he came out. Oh, did he? Yasser came out. Like, nearly all my boxers came out, you know, different periods during the year. Okay. They came out to train as well. So the support I had was, you know, phenomenal. Yeah. You know, my wife, you know, came out at times as well to, to come and see me. Um, my son, you know, yeah. my parents came out one time as well. Because <laughs> so, I was out there for nearly, in total, maybe two and a half years. Oh, my. Wow. Yes, yeah, so it was a long, long time. And obviously, because there was no flights during a lot, a lot of that, a, the first year, you know, did you we, need a we visa? were all stuck there. Did you need like a visa or something like to stay out that long? Uh, we were, I was coming back and forth. Oh, okay. Yeah. But eventually, yeah, we did apply for one yeah, uh, towards yeah. the end. I think it was like the third training camp. Yeah. Um, and did get that. So, yeah. But yeah, the very different experience. But again, grateful for it. Yeah. You know, um, you know, to be, to walk out in front of that many fans uh, is an experience. Might never get that again. Yeah. So um, we will always be grateful to Dillian for that. Yeah, and obviously believing in me that um, you know we could go out there and we could work, you know. And uh, obviously, one of my proudest moments was his uh, rematch with Povetkin. Uh, yeah, you know, I think I think on that day, everything that we'd worked on, you know, from the time I met him, it just came together. Yeah, that's you know? what I was going to talk about. There, how was that in Gibraltar? Was it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So how was that? Yeah. So yeah, and um, Yusuf was on that card as well, yeah. weren't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I heard that you had to. There was a mad like travel thing where you had to drive from Portugal into Gibraltar. Was that was that the case, or did you get a flight? Yeah, yeah. What was did, it? A that, was a, that was a long drive. I, I they, and I don't I don't know who I was actually in that. In that we had a, like a small minibus, but them lot, the rest of them, they went off long. You know, yeah. like way ahead of us anyway. And I, I don't really like driving. Like, like I, I like driving myself. But when someone's dri- when someone else is driving, especially when they drive a little bit quick, I'm like. Oh, it's not who, who, so who's behind the wheel? I'm not going to say. <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean the small minibus that we had, you know, uh, I think one, I think it was one of the managers at the uh, centre we were staying at. He was driving. Oh, okay, a sensible driver, so I was all right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good. yeah. yeah, yeah. Interesting. Oh, okay. Interesting. Yeah, but yeah. yeah, even even that dynamic was crazy because the majority of the train UCS training was done by the other head coach Nick. Okay. And then they flew out to Gibraltar. So yeah. yeah, it felt good. You know, yeah. we were in the hotel, like us, you know, felt like everything had come together again. Yeah. You know? it's, it's always better when Nick's there, you know, because we, you know, we built this together. So it feels a bit unusual when he's not there. You know, I do, I do feel, it does feel like something's not quite right when he's not there in the corner of a fight. Because that's, that's who I go to. Yeah. You know, every, every coach has a team, you know, it's just like in football. football. You know, managers, they want to bring their own staff, training staff. It's, it's no different in boxing. You've got guys that you trust. You know, whether, whether it's wrapping hands, whether it's SNC, you've got your own team. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I had to come away from that and join those guys. But, again, I think uh, Simon and Al, you know, the Stiglian's physio, um, you know, those two guys, uh, Al's SNC coach, they, they're one of the best I've seen. Very, very knowledgeable. And it's no I'm in an R and if you ask them something, they, they always have the answers, you know. They know they know what they're doing out there. Yeah, and uh, you know Simon done a really really good good job with Dillian. You know, um, just gives him everything he needs. Yeah, it's, yeah, really good. They've got a really good team. Yeah, really good team. Yeah. So after you, so you had uh, so after with Dillian. So after that, um, you just parted ways, and then you carried on with your fighters. Mm-hmm. So with your fighters that you've got now, which ones would you say? stand out for you the most who people should look out for because you have quite a big stable of fighters um <laughs> you know what i mean i'm glad you got i'm glad you got the list too, yeah, yeah, yeah yeah i've got you've got, got the list you know so yusuf kamari uh very good talent um he's one of my favorite yeah. british fighters at the moment of um i like his style the way you go on the shoulder right and left hooks and stuff like that so yeah, I'd, I'd honestly have to say he's probably He's probably one of the only fighters I've ever trained to box like how I would box. Okay, because I remember when he punched up that Kane Baker. Oh, yeah. That, yeah. that was a really good performance, yeah. yeah. A lot, got a lot of respect for Kane. He's another one that takes on any challenges. So, yeah, that was a good, yeah. Kane will bring it to anybody. But yeah. I did say before the fight that Yusuf was on another level. 
Yeah. And it was funny because a lot of people were actually betting against him because they didn't know who Youssef was. But they yeah. knew who Kane was because he'd been on match room a few times. Yeah, yeah. But I knew it was going to happen. Um, yeah. But yeah, he's, he, yeah, I think Yusuf's been at my gym since about 15, 16 years old. But funny enough, not many people know this. I was actually coaching him before that um, because he's from originally from All Stars. But he lives in Wembley. Yeah. And when I was coaching at Wembley Boxing Club, Yusuf would come to any boxing club. So we started working together like a lot earlier than what people think. Yeah. And because it's, it's, a, it's a style that he wanted to learn. And that's why he ended up coming to Neesden. And he said, yeah, you know, this is, this is, this is the style of boxing I want to learn. I want to learn it from you. So, but he was, he's been a pleasure to teach because that style to me is the most difficult of all boxing styles. That one, you know, it's like got inches and millimeters and you get it wrong and then it's, it's, it's trouble. Yeah. You know, but, um, you know, it's the same as me. I had to take a hammering in sparring before I knew how to do it. Mm -hmm. Like, the, the coach will explain certain things, but it's different when you get in there and someone's like throwing like crazy shots at you. Yeah, because you're in the danger zone. Yeah. You're in the danger you zone. Are. You're in that heat all the time. And it, and to master it, you're going to have to stay in there until you get comfortable with it. Yeah. And he was willing to do that. Um, and he also had the IQ and the fundamentals to do it. I like that. You know, he had the fundamentals to do it. The other, um, the other guys, I didn't see that style in them. So I don't ever force it upon anybody. I saw it in TJ Williams and I saw it in Youssef. The other guys, I taught them a completely different style. I was very comfortable with a lot of different styles because of all the, you know, the, all the education that I had early, you know, all the study and all the, the boxing and so on. So it's like I've, every time a fighter comes to me, I can almost put a name on them. Yeah. You know, I almost know, right, okay, I want you to fight like this guy. You know, Ivan Robinson, another guy, you know, really good style to watch. Mosley, another good style to watch. So I kind of like, like, I know what I want to do with you. And if you just do what I tell you, you'll be fine. You know, yeah. but it's only when you're getting them early enough you can do that. Yeah. You know, once you get a fighter that's been out for a while, you know, he already has a way that he wants to do things. And if you try and change too much of it, then it's a disaster. Yeah. So yeah. I've, I've learned that. I learned that very, very early in my, in my coaching career that, you know, even though I have a preference, uh, a style, as most coaches that have boxed before, you know, they were taught a certain way. So it's obviously natural for them to go on teach what they were taught. Yeah. Um, but, you know, um, it doesn't work for everybody. And, uh, yeah, it's good because I've had to, you know, be versatile. Um, there's still some stars here and there that I'm not particularly comfortable with. Yeah. Uh, still learning. Um, anyone who says they're not learning in boxing is, well, you can never stop learning. Yeah. You know, every time I watch these guys spar, I'll see something different. You know, and it's, um, right, you know, they've made that move. Well, maybe if they tried this and then the next time we spar, we'll try it. You know, I'm always trying to learn new things because as much as you practice and train you're in training camp because you're studying for a certain opponent you know on that day they come to you and they just come with something completely different yeah so i always try and create different scenarios and if you get your body in this position this is what you should do so and you has been probably the best at adapting and being able to do that yeah um, so yeah very comfortable with yusuf um you know another, another fight i've had for a long time uh I've been around a long time. You know, Dennis were home, Adrian Redman. You know, these guys have been around for a long, long time. Yeah. I've seen Dennis, uh, Adrian Redman fight on the Boxing High shows. Yeah. Good fighter. Yeah. So, um, yeah, tell us about um, K Prosper. He is he Aaron Prosper's brother? <laughs> this is like, uh, it's a bit crazy, actually. I, I keep asking him. He said, yeah, I think they are, but not close. I think uh, they are related, but not close. So I'm not. I'm to be honest. I'm not sure. So because, you don't know if they're brothers or cousins. Because his because his cousin Paul Webb, he, he, like he laughs and jokes about it. So I'm not sure if they've been serious or not. Because he keeps saying, "Yeah, we could have prosper, be prosper if they're not not related." Because I think they're in the same weight division. But um, just, I, I think they are related. Yeah, because that's not a, that's not a no, normal. That, that's that not Smith or yeah. yeah. I don't know. I don't want to talk about you know certain men back in the day. You know. Oh. Rolling Stones. I so. hear that. I hear that. <laughs> so you never know. But yeah. So yeah, tell us about uh, Kay. Kay Prosper. Yeah. yeah, me and, again, me and Kay are very, very close. Yeah. Um, you know, he was signed with Steve Goodwin. Uh, Steve told him, you need to make a change. Uh, I'm going to send you down to Zav. Uh, I'd never seen him box. I never heard of him. So yeah. honestly, yeah. And, uh, you know, I thought, you know what, let me, uh, at that time I was like, I've got what I want. I built the guys in my gym uh, from the amateurs to the pros. I really didn't want to get involved in 
anyone outside of my gym. Um, it was a bit different with Yasser because Yasser hadn't had his debut yet. So yeah. he had boxed in uh, Finchley Boxing Club as an amateur. Mm-hmm. And then he came to me as a pro. Um, that was a bit different. But in terms of if you had a pro fight before, I really wasn't that enthusiastic about it because that's not really the direction that me and Nick wanted to go. But um, what I did was I, I said, okay, let me have a look at this guy and see you know, what I can do with him. So I called one of my boxers at the time. It was uh, Kian Thomas, Kian Tech, Tech Thomas, you know, uh, technically very good. Um, okay, you know, arranged sparring. Sparring was heated, you know, six rounds. Mm. But K showed me a lot because when I'd actually watched him on YouTube, I didn't actually see that. Um, very versatile. He was able to switch. Had a lot of power. He was really, he was, he was he- Really heavy handed, like left hand, right hand. He was both, he had good power in both hands. Yeah. Um, he was quite elusive during the sparring as well. Athletic. I was like, okay. Yeah, this. So I called Steve and said, yeah, you know. So then he started training me from then. And uh, we won a good run. I remember he wanted, to, he wanted to jump straight into an English title fight. You know, and that was the other thing I really liked about Kay. He, you know, he, um, he wanted to challenge himself. He said, if I fight that guy and I win that belt, I'll be the first. Luton fighter to win an English title okay. and I would have got it from a champion and I really want to do that and I didn't know him that well at the time but I thought but hold on a minute I haven't you know we haven't had a fight together yet so I said I tell you what let's let's have a, an eliminator first let Steve arrange a fight for you and then then we'll go for it and I think he had the eliminate against Nathan Weiss um, yeah, yeah my friend yeah performed really well I think he stopped Nathan about five in the fifth or sixth round uh, K was DK. I mean, I called a shot from the corner, and K just executed it immediately, and it, and it dropped him. And um, I said, you know, yeah, I can definitely work with this guy. And uh, yeah, we just started training hard, just built from there. Yeah, you know, it hasn't been easy. You know, K has got his own again. He's got his own style, and I've had to work with that style. Um, but you know, I did, I did manage to bring the best out of K. And uh, you know, I said to him, you've overachieved. You know, to fail at Southern Era, Southern Era level, and then to eventually go on to fight for a European title against Sandor Martin. Yeah. And I warned everyone about Sandor, you know, before, well, when that fight was made. Um, because, again, I'm, I study boxing all the time, so I know all these guys, you know, and, you know, unfortunately for Kay, you know, I didn't get a chance to train him for that fight because yeah. I was out in Portugal. You know, when I came back after Dillian and Youssef on, on that Gibraltar show, I think Kay was going up maybe two or three weeks later. So the only thing I managed to do when I got when I get back was maybe set up maybe two or three spars. Um, I'm not sitting here telling you he would have beat him. I'm just saying I think he would have performed a lot better. Yeah. And to be fair to Kay, he'd never made any money out of boxing. When that phone call came for a European title, you know, he'd been boxing on small shows his whole life. Yeah. So he couldn't turn it down. I said, listen, we just have to just we have to just go for it. And we went out there and um he gave it everything. You know, referee was a nightmare to be honest with you. I, yeah. I almost got thrown out that corner. Yeah. Um, I, and I didn't even actually even do anything. Um, but, you know, when Kay was being aggressive and getting sand on the ropes and doing good work, the referee kept breaking it up. Obviously, you know, listen, you go to someone's hometown, don't cry about it. That's that's going to happen. But, you know, he gave it his best. And, uh, yeah, you know, he hasn't... I don't think he's boxed since then. A couple yeah. of injuries. He's coming back now, though. I expect him to be out maybe September. So, yeah. Uh, Kay, me, Kay, and Paul Webb, we're very, very close. You know, we do good business together and um, we're going to be promoting boxing shows together soon as well so oh that's good I'm very very glad that I managed to meet someone like Kay you know um, yeah. again he's, he was my first champion as well okay and as you saw Sandor Martin um, he went on to beat Mikey Garcia so that's not yeah. a and bad I, person I, and to I lose won to. money on that fight I, t- I, I said to everybody he's going to beat him and then all, anyway, everyone was saying I won money on that as well yeah everyone yeah. saying no I said listen I, I first hand experience I'm in the corner watching this guy and he's just so slick yeah you know, and Kay is quite athletic, but you know, and he beat Teofimo really. Again, close fight. You know, I remember one of the knockdowns was cancelled, which was a knockdown when you saw on the replay. And you saw definitely one was, was definitely a, a knockdown. Yeah, definitely. no, he dropped him twice, but mm. one only one was counted. Counted, yeah, yeah, but the other one would should have been, and he would have won the fight had it had that second one been counted yeah. against Teo. So it just shows you the good. So um, yeah, we're a bit short on time. So talk about with us lastly about Ergo. Elezaj, the is it Albanian heavyweight. Yeah, yeah. Um, again, he's had a couple of fight, a few fights at the uh, for our amateur club, and uh, he came out to Portugal 
okay. and sparred Dillian. Um, it was only supposed to come out for maybe a week or two weeks. He ended up staying for about five or six weeks. Um, you know, really good kid. Very, very talented. Again, I said I wouldn't teach anybody else that style, but again, he, like Yusuf, he seems to understand, you know, the kind of position that he should be in when he gets involved in exchanges. Yeah. Um, you know, he can roll shots off the shoulder really well, counter. Very, very talented. Um, he's only 21 years old, just turned pro. He's at his debut. He's out again uh, next month, the 20th. Uh, really excited about his journey. You know, he sparred Fraser Clark. You know, he's sparred Jamie TKV. He just sparred Dempsey at Matram. Can hold his own against anybody. And Dempsey McKean. Yeah. 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 Really, really excited yeah. about him. Um, as I am with all the fighters, you know, again, and Sedem Amra was another one. Yeah. My female boxer. You know, she just had her debut the other day in Belgium. Yeah. Um, it's taken a long time to get her out, but we finally got her out. And uh, I expect her to win uh, at least a Commonwealth title or world title within the next... I say twelve to eighteen months. Okay. Very, very talented. Um, you know, she had I think she had about eleven or twelve amateur fights. Yeah. And, uh one them all. I know a lot of them were by knockout as well. So <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, so I'm expecting her to put some of these girls away as well. So yeah. Yeah. You know, I've got I have got a really good stable at the moment. So and Jesse Brandon, another one. Yeah. You know, hot, hot, yeah. Yeah, I've seen him fight, I've seen some highlights. Just boxed the other day, yeah, not first round knockout. Yeah. Um, he looks like a superstar. Yeah, and they box for Finch D. I think he had about forty amateur fights. Again, he's from the same area as me. Uh, you know, well, quite close. And um, you know, I know I've known Jesse for a long, long time. Always saw him. You know, going to the gym, just like, sticking with it, stick with it. So when he decided to turn pro, he came to me. And uh, disturbing sports to me and Courtney, they've done a great job with him. And uh, yeah, um, I expect him to sign with Wasserman and uh, have a great journey. You know, he's um. Very, very talented kid, listens well, wants to learn. And uh, again, he's got his own unique style. You know, it reminds me of some of the fighters from like the 80s and 90s. Yeah. Um, Blue Slimmed, uh, you know, Harold Knight really liked him when he came over to Portugal. Mm-hmm. Sparred K, Sparred Yusse, Sparred Yasser. You know, um, yeah, you know, he's a, there's a lot to work on, but I've got time. You know, he's just had, he's only had two fights. Harold, the Shadow, shadow Knight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good guy, yeah. Good, good guy. Also, how did you um, get involved with, Bilal Fawaz, because he's been on the amateur circuit for quite a number of years and yeah. as he, he's had quite a lot of uh, tr- uh, trouble trying to get his license. Yeah. So yeah. he's finally pro now. So how did you get involved with him? Because he's from Northwest as well, isn't it? Yeah, I, I actually, with Bilal, I was actually helping one of my friends, uh, you know, Jay, he's, uh, Jay Boogie. He's, 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 he was coaching, he was the head coach for Bilal for, for, for a while. And, uh, you know, then he, uh, I think he brought him down to my gym, started doing some work. I said, yeah, I'll just support you in the corner. That's one thing I don't mind doing. I like working with coaches and supporting them, as I do for the other head coach, Nick, who he's got, you know, Hatim um, Ahmed, really good fighter. Um, he's got another one coming up, Ernest Warchick as well. Okay, yeah. yeah. So they're guys to look out for as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, tell us about your Bravos link-up deal. I see <laughs> you with all the equipment, all the gear and that. So uh, that you know, I was... I, I'm honestly, as I've, I've approached sponsorship like I was a boxer. Yeah. Um, you know, I've had really, really good support. Um, the, these guys all came around same time. Uh, Anas from Bravos, my boxing gear, Tiger Bay, Shisha and restaurant. Um, you know, P. I'm Rob looking Sonic. to go there. Um, after the Sonny Edwards fight. Um, yeah, let, let me know when I'll, Yusuf's yeah, yeah. Yusuf's fighting on there. I'll sort that out. No problem. Let me know. Oh, thanks, um, but man. those those guys, honestly. Um. You know, and Kevin from KMT, you know, always giving my hats and stuff. Yeah. Those three th- th- those three companies, they've been sponsoring me since 2017. And uh, they are definitely the reason why I'm able to do what I'm doing because otherwise I wouldn't be able to do this full time. So I've had really, really good sponsors. You know, a lot of guys get sponsors and then they last a year or two years or, you know, but I've been really lucky. So I haven't had to reach out to anybody else. You know, I've had, I've had that support system from early, so... Yeah, you know, been really, really grateful to them. And all, all I, all I said to them when I met them, because I hadn't had, I hadn't had any pro fighters yet. Yeah, I just said to them, I will be, I will get there, I will be on big shows, and you know, your brand will be seen. Um, just trust the journey, you know. And they all said okay. Yeah. So I wouldn't expect them to all say okay, but they said okay. And I'm just glad to be able to just you know, put their brand out there, and um, you know, it's it's and it's more about it's the relationship that I have with them. You know, especially uh, down at Tiger Bay, Mubzumpi. 
you know, so that we're, you know, really close. Anything I need, people will always say to me, what do you need, what do you need, what do you need? And, um, you know, the most important thing for me at that time was each time my guys are going out, they're on small shows, it's the tickets, it's hard for everybody. Yeah. You know, when, oh, okay, we'll buy five or we'll buy ten, or, you know, we'll buy five ringside or what else do you need or we'll promote it. That has been, the, you know, the biggest support, especially from Ke um, Kevin KMT as well. And that's Bravos. They always buy tickets for these guys, you know, when they're fighting. So, yeah, the support system has been amazing. Yeah. yeah. Great stuff, man. So thank you for telling us that. So we're moving on to the penultimate round. This is the last bit. You must have seen this before. No. No? Nervous now. Okay. So it's a series of questions and uh, multiple choice. Just So we'll start off easy so you get the hang of it. So here we go. Red corner or blue corner? Red. Left hook or straight right? If I hit you with the left hook, it's problems. But the right hand's good too. Everlast or fly? None. Bravos. Cleo Rays or Grants? None. Bravos. Rival or winning? None. Bravos. All right. Uh, all right, for boots then. Nike boots or Adidas boots? I hate boxing boots. Oh, do you? I pay eight. So that, that and boxing tutorials, those two things are hard. I don't know, but, but boots... The boots I used to wear were um, Adidas. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Same as me. Uh, York Hall or O2 Arena? Both. I love them both. Wembley Arena or um, Copper Box? Wembley. It's close to home. Mm. Tupac or Biggie? Definitely Biggie. Nas or Jay-Z? Oh, Nas by a long way. Ali or Tyson? Mike Tyson. Ali. Jack Johnson or Joe Lewis? Both. For the Sugarmen, Ray Robinson or Ray Leonard? They both did their thing in the era. I'd, I'd say both. I can't, I, it'll be disrespectful for me to choose one. I think they're both great. Michael Buffer or Jimmy Lennon Jr.? <laughs> That's a good one. Um... Say Michael Buffer. Mike Goodall or Bob Alexander? At the moment, I'd say Mike. Mills Lane or Steve Willis? Uh, Mills Lane. Mills Lane. So for fights, uh, Spencer Crawford? Crawford. Only just. Okay. That should be coming soon. Viterbiev or Bivol? Bivol. Jam Jamel, Jamel Charlo or Tim Tejou? Oh, Charlo. Devin Haney or Lomachenko? I expect Haney to win. Yeah. But a close fight, though. Canelo or David Benavides? I think Canelo would be too sharp. Uh, Akoli or Richard Riappo? I'm going to go with Richard. I'll go rep for you. Yeah. yeah. Fury or Usyk? Usyk. The same. Definitely. AJ or Wilder? 50-50. Javonte Davis or Shakur Stevenson? Shakur. BMW or Mercedes? I don't know. Mercedes. <laughs> Audi or Lexus? Lexus. Rolls Royce or Bentley? Bentley. I don't know why people keep bringing their wives here because they know, but uh, well, you don't watch the show, do you? Or what's, do you? What show? This show. So dark skin or light skin? <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a good one. Both. Uh, Both. Uh, slim line or curvy thick? Nah, slim man. Okay. I, don't like, I don't like big girls. <laughs> natural or surgery? 100% natural. Good. Garage or house music? Both. Drum and bass or jungle? Oh, definitely. Both. Yeah, both. You're saying a lot of both, man. Yeah, R&B or slow jams? I don't like any of them. No? They're both annoying. Oh, come on, man. They're both annoying. Dance hall or afro beats? Both annoying as well. Reggae or revival? 
I don't like any of them. What? You're Caribbean, man. All right, you got to answer this next one. Soca or Calypso? Oh, I don't like any of them, man. Just because I'm black, I don't have to like it. No, but you're Caribbean, no, man. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't. All right. So we're going to get, because you're, you're half Jamaican, half St. Vincent and Grenadines, right? Mm. Okay, cool. So fried dumpling or mandongo dumpling? Fried dumpling. Fish cakes or buljol? Fish cakes. Red pea soup or callaloo soup? Uh, red pea soup. Saltfish fritters or banana fritters? Saltfish, definitely. Brown stew chicken or Guinness bottle chicken stew? Brown stew chicken. Rum cake or ducana? None. Okay. Uh, Ray and Nephew or Sunset? <laughs> I don't drink alcohol. Listen, Sunset, yeah, that is like 84.5%. That it took off my head. Have you tried it? Yeah, that's serious. You need to try it, man. I don't drink Listen. at all. Never have done. Oh, you're boring. <laughs> Captain Bly or Captain Morgan? Nah, none. Ugh, come on, man. Uh, I might start drinking later this year, though. Yeah. I'll turn 50 now, so maybe I have a little drink every now and then. Yeah, you have, have some with me. Peppered steak or oxtail? <sighs> Peppered steak. Good. All right, so attributes in a fighter. What do you prefer, speed or power? Speed. Boxer or a fighter? Box fighter. Footwork or hand placement? What's more important to you? Footwork. For equipment, mitt pads, paddles or the sticks? None. Body belt or the circle drum pad? (sighs) Too much wear and tear, all of them, to be honest with you, but yeah, I use them all. Okay. Do you prefer orthodox or southpaw fighters? I like both. Uh... Countryside or city life? Countryside. Um, and then top rank or PBC? PBC. Boxer or matchroom? It's starting to even up a bit now. Yeah. But maybe still slightly favouring matchroom, slightly. And then last one. Kingstown or Kingston? <laughs> Kingston. <laughs> Kingston, yeah? yeah. Oh, okay. No, I like that. So, yeah, that's the uh, penultimate round completed. So, thank you very much, man. Um, great to hear your story and coming on. Uh, we'll definitely get you back on again. Um, where can people find you? Give them the plug for your pages and also oh. what's going on with some of your fighters. Uh, you've got, so you've got Yusuf Kamari fighting. Yeah, Reece Wembley, Bellotti. Reece Wembley. Bellotti. So yeah, June. so that's for the uh, British title eliminator because yeah. that was meant to be for the English, but it got elevated. No, uh, it was it was always a British thing. British title yeah. eliminator. Yeah, I'm, so, try, I'm trying to get another belt. Yep. added to that. And then, so if you've got the other dates for your all your fighters, yeah, that one's tenth of June. Um, Ergo Elizaj, my heavyweight, he's out York Core, twentieth of May. Um, just waiting for confirmation. Jesse Brandon's next fight should be maybe late June, early July. So then Amma should be out late June, early July as well. Um, uh, Nick's uh, fighter, uh, Ahmed Hatim. I think he's out in June as well. Maybe June 17th. Um, so yeah, really busy stable. And Adrian Ribbon's out soon. Um, got new fighter as well. Um, By the name of Khan Kani, that's his surname. Amar, mm-hmm. uh, well to wait, he's eight and oh. Uh, he should be out, I think it's first of July. Yeah, he's out. So, I'm going to be out nearly every weekend, like as soon as like what from, from the 20th of May. I, I've got someone else actually 27, I think that might be Adrian Redman. So, I think the next from the 20th, I think the next six, seven weekends, I'm going to be you know at events and. That's what I love the most is being busy. I like yeah. being I like being at fights. Like if I if I haven't got my own fighters fighting, I'm going to watch. Yeah, you know, um, they're really good at matchroom. You know, I, you know they all, whenever I send an email and ask if I can attend, I always get looked after. So yeah, I like going to all the shows. Yeah, that's good, man. So yes, so they can follow you at Xavier Miller. Yeah, on official official Xavier Miller on Instagram, on Instagram, uh, Facebook Xavier Miller, Twitter. Uh, Hardly ever, I don't think I hardly ever used to it, but it's still the same. Xavier TikTok, 
TikTok is IQ Xavier Miller. Okay. Yeah. And um, what's the what's your mate? What's the ethos behind the name IQ Boxing? Just lastly, um, you know, we, me and Nick, we just wanted to because we're both coming from an education background, and we wanted to produce, you know, intelligent fighters. It just it it just sounded good at the time, you know. Yeah. We would just get talking about your IQ level and stuff like that. So, and um, yeah, that was where it would come from, really. Have you taken an IQ test before? Yeah, many. What's your score? Uh, it's way up there. Okay. IQ level is mad high. But, okay. You know, That's obviously good. the years of boxing have you know. Yeah, we all get a bit punchy. Toll, but yeah, <laughs> it is what it is. Yeah. But yeah. yeah, great having you on, man. And um, that's it, guys. That's another episode wrapped up of the Neutral Corner, proudly sponsored by Treasure Boxing Club. Once it also Ashley Fearfane, so you'd know him from All Stars as well. Yeah, good so guy. Big him up. So yeah, that's it. It's Danny Glover. It's Xavier Miller. You know where it is. And remember, guys, persistence beats resistance. <laughs>